Chapter 8, Public Opinion. Okay, what is public opinion? Well, according to your textbook, the definition of public, of public opinion is public attitudes or beliefs about government or politics. And I think that's, that's a pretty common sense uh, definition of something that uh, I think we probably all know uh, something about, you know, public opinion. Okay, why is public opinion important? Well, because of the type of government we have, because we're a democratic republic where we vote our leaders into office, it's important for American political leaders like the president, like members of Congress, like governors and mayors to be able to identify and understand how the public feels on important issues. They, they need to uh, know what we're thinking in order to govern in a way uh, that reflects our desires. Right? We uh, elect our leaders to represent us, and in order for them to represent us, they need to know what we want them to do. They need to know uh, how we feel about certain issues. So public opinion is important from a policy perspective. Uh, it's a very important uh, thing uh, for effective governing, for making good decisions. But there's also a very important uh, political aspect to it. Uh, politicians spend a lot of time and money trying to gauge public opinion, and in a few minutes I'm going to talk about how they do that. Why do they do this? Why do they spend so much time and money trying to gauge our public opinion, trying to understand what what we're feeling. Because in order to get uh, elected, politicians need voters to believe that they understand their concerns. When people go to vote, they tend to vote for the person who they feel understands them. Uh, they tend to vote for people, for political leaders, who uh, they think gets them, knows what they want, and is and is willing to do what they want for them. Uh, so, uh, especially around election time, public opinion becomes a very, very important thing. So politicians need voters to believe they understand their concerns, and the worst thing a politician can do is to be seen by the voters as not understanding their concerns. The worst thing a political leader can do is to be seen as out of touch. Uh, that's an easy way to lose an election, and that's exactly what happened back in 1992, uh, a year uh, where we had a presidential election between uh, George H.W. Bush, who was president at the time, was running for election against Bill Clinton. And uh, during the debates that Clinton and Bush had against each other in October of 1992, George H.W. Bush came across as uh, not in touch with public opinion, uh, not understanding what the public was concerned with, and most importantly, uh, in some ways, seeming totally uh not just out of touch, but as somebody who really didn't uh, care. Uh, for example, in one of the debates, uh, the camera caught George H.W. Bush looking at his watch, uh, which gave the impression that he couldn't wait for the debate to end. He couldn't wait to get out of there. He wanted to see how much time was left. And it, it, the impression among the public was that, well, he doesn't really care about being at the debate. He didn't really care about talking to real people uh, or trying to hear what people were concerned about. In another debate where people were actually in the audience asking questions in a town hall style debate, uh, he really struggled to uh, understand what one voter was trying to ask him about. Uh, and uh, I'm going to play you a, 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 a video clip from uh, YouTube to show you exactly what happened 
exactly uh, how George H.W. Bush was questioned and how he uh, responded uh, in, a, in a very bad way. Uh, and this is the moment that many, many people, many experts thought he lost the election, Bill Clinton, and went on to become the new president of the United States. Uh, not only because, but partly because of, of the scene uh, that you're about to watch. We have a question right here. Yes, how has the national debt personally affected each of your lives? And if it hasn't, how can you honestly find a cure for the economic problems of the common people if you have no experience in what's ailing them? Well, I think the national debt affects everybody. Uh, obviously, it has, has a lot to do with interest rates. It has. She's you, saying you personally. You, on a personal basis, how has it affected you? Has it affected you personally? Well, I'm sure it has. I love my grand grandchildren. I want to think wow. that. I want to think think that they're going to be able to afford an education. I think that that's an important part of being a parent. I, if the question, if you're maybe I won't get it wrong, are you suggesting that if somebody has means, that the national debt doesn't affect them? Well, what I'm, saying, I'm, I'm not sure I get it. Help me with a question and I'll well, try to answer. I've had friends that have been laid off from jobs. Yeah. I know people who cannot afford to pay the mortgage on their homes, their car payment. I have personal yeah. uh, problems with the national debt, but how has it affected you? And if you have no experience in it, how can you help us if you don't know what we're feeling? I think she means more the recession, um, the economic problems today the country faces well, rather listen, than the you ought to you ought to be in the white house for a day and hear the, what i hear and see what i see and read the mail i read and touch the people that i touch from time to time i was in the lomax ame church it's a black church just outside of washington dc and i read in the uh in the bulletin about teenage pregnancies about the difficulty that families are having to meet ends, make ends meet. I talk to parents. I mean, you got to care. Everybody cares if people aren't doing well. But I don't think it. I don't think it's fair to say you haven't had cancer, therefore you don't know what it's like. I don't think it's fair to say uh, you know whatever it is if you haven't been hit by it personally. But everybody's affected by the debt because of the tremendous interest that goes into paying on that debt. Everything's more expensive. Everything comes out of your pocket and my pocket. So it's, it's that. But I think in terms of the recession, of course you feel it when you're president of the United States. And that's why I'm trying to do something about it by stimulating the export, investing more, better education systems. Thank Have you. I'm glad to clarify. Tell me how it's affected you again. Um, you know people who've lost their well, jobs, yeah. lost their homes. Uh -huh. Well, I've been governor of a small state for 12 years. I'll tell you how it's affected me. Every year, Congress and the President sign laws that makes us, make us do more things, it gives us less money to do it with. I see people in my state, middle class people, their taxes have gone up in Washington and their services have gone down, while the wealthy have gotten tax cuts. I, I have seen what's happened in this last four years when, in my state, when people lose their jobs, there's a good chance I'll know them by their names. When a factory closes, I know the people who ran it. When the businesses go bankrupt, I know them. And I've been out here for 13 months, meeting in meetings just like this, ever since October, with people like you all over America, people that have lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, lost their health insurance. What I want you to understand is the national debt is not the only cause of that. It is because America has not invested in its people. It is because we have not grown. It is because we've had 12 years of trickle-down economics. We've gone from first to 12th in the world in wages. We've had four years where we produced no private sector jobs. Most people are working harder for less money than they were making 10 years ago. It is because we are in the grip of a failed economic theory. And this decision you're about to make better be about what kind of economic theory you want. Not just people saying, I'm going to go fix it, but what are we going to do? What I think we have to do is invest in American jobs, American education, control American health care costs, and bring the American people together again. Okay, so... That was a really good example of how politicians can show that they either understand 
the concerns of the voters or not. Uh, George H.W. Bush started off uh, not really understanding the question. Uh, maybe that wasn't totally his fault. Maybe it, it wasn't really fair uh, to, to blame him. But he certainly came across as not understanding, as disconnected, uh, and it really hurt him. And then Bill Clinton came in and went right up to that woman and said, well, you know, tell me how it affected you again. And then spoke in very personal terms about how he knows people who've lost their jobs, uh, who've had their businesses uh, go bankrupt uh, in his state. Uh, And he really came across as very empathetic, as totally getting it. And understand the, the concerns of, of, of voters. And and that's one reason why Bill Clinton ended up winning that uh, presidential election in 1992 and becoming uh, president of the United States. Uh, so uh, one of the things, obviously, that public opinion um, uh, uh, reflects is the political beliefs of people. And here in the United States, we have a very pluralistic society, which means that we have a society made up of very different kinds of people uh, in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, national background, and also political beliefs. Uh, People uh, all over the country have very different uh, political belief systems, very different ways of looking politically at, at, at the big issues that concern all of us, the economy, the military, social issues like abortion and gay rights and, and uh, 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 racial tensions and things like that. In the next uh, lecture, I'm going to talk a lot more about the different kinds of political political beliefs in the United States, what we call political ideologies. Uh, But for right now, I want to talk about uh, where people where people uh, you know develop their political beliefs, how someone develops as sort of maybe a conservative or liberal or somewhere in between. Uh, So where do people get their political viewpoints? Uh, Lots of different places. Uh, Family, for one. Uh, Family is one uh, big uh, source of where someone's political beliefs develop. So, for example, if you grow up in a conservative family, you're very likely to become a conservative yourself. If you grow up uh, in a liberal family, you're probably more likely to be uh, become a liberal. That's not always true, but uh, for the most part, I, I think it is true. Uh, media is another place where people get their political viewpoints. The type of news shows you watch or the type of magazines you read, or especially now because of the Internet, the type of, of Internet news that you go to to read will uh, help you define uh, your political viewpoints, whether you're uh, very conservative, very liberal, or somewhere in the middle. Uh, School is an obvious uh, place where people develop their political viewpoints, especially college. Another big uh, source of of, uh, uh, political viewpoint is religious faith. People who are very religious tend to be more conservative on social issues like abortion uh, and, gay, and gay marriage. So uh, the more religious you are, the more likely you are to be opposed to abortion. The more liberal you are, uh, uh, the, the less religious you are, I mean, the more uh, liberal you probably are, and liberals tend to... Uh, be in favor of a woman's right to have an abortion. Uh, Geography also plays a small part in this as well because uh, if you live in more urban areas, you're probably more likely to be liberal and that 
is because of the last thing here, race, gender, sex. Uh, urban areas tend to be more pluralistic, meaning there are more different kinds of people who live in urban areas like New York City. As all different kinds of people, people from all over the world, different races, different ethnic backgrounds, uh, and so the more uh, the more time you spend around different people, people who are not like you, the more liberal you become, the more open you become to accepting uh, different uh, political beliefs. Uh, and so I think you, you're probably going to be more liberal, whereas uh, in in certain parts of the country, which are less pluralistic, uh, more homogeneous, where meaning where everybody is very much alike, you tend to be more single-minded and probably more conservative. Okay, uh, so these are the places; these are the sources. Uh, for where people get uh, tend to get their political viewpoints, family, media, school, religious faith, geography, race, gender, and sex. Okay, so how is public opinion measured? It's measured through opinion polls. So if you've ever seen on TV uh, or in a newspaper the mention of a public opinion poll, uh, this is what we're talking about, the, the measurement, the instrument through which uh, political experts measure uh, public opinion. Uh, these polls are scientific, meaning that uh, what happens is you get a group, uh, you get a, a polling group or a, a pollster, somebody who's an expert at this, who's either working for a newspaper or a television station or working directly for a candidate to do polling for a, uh, an election, like the upcoming presidential election and congressional elections. Uh, what they do is they go out and uh, they... Uh, question a, a group of people. They, they ask a group of people a series of questions to determine what people are thinking about certain issues or what they're thinking about a certain candidate who's running for a political office. So there are two things that go into the poll. First is writing up the questions uh, to ask people. And then the second is to uh, formulate a targeted sample of people, of who you're going to question. So the idea is that you want to uh, target a sample that is representative of the entire population. Okay, so the, the best way to get the most accurate poll would be to simply ask every single voter in the United States this the same set of questions and then you'll get an accurate uh, measurement of the entire country's public opinion that would be a great thing to do but it's impossible because the country is too big there are too many people to question and the, and the way that pollsters question these people is pretty much by calling them uh, they simply call them on the phone and hope that they are willing to answer uh, questions, uh, which is one of the things that makes public opinion polling now harder than it used to be because now uh, most people use cell phones and uh, more people now uh, on cell phones uh, will not answer a call that they don't recognize from a number they don't recognize. But that's, you know, that's, that's uh, a, a, another point. Uh, so instead of uh, trying to talk to every single voter, what pollsters do is they come up with a scientific statistical formula that's designed to target a sample of people who represent the larger group of people that you that you're, you you want to measure? So, for example, uh, in uh, let's say you're doing a public opinion poll for New York State politics for Governor Cuomo, 
running for re-election. So let's say there are uh, a million people living in uh, New York State, and you know that 10% of the people who live in New York State are Hispanic. So if there are a million people in New York State, you can't uh, question all a million of them uh, within a day or two, which is how polls are done, They're usually done over a couple of days, and then the results are, uh, are, are, are presented almost immediately. Instead of uh, uh, targeting all one million people, you target a hundred people. And so if 10% of the uh, total population in New York State is Hispanic, then you want roughly 10% of your sample also to be Hispanics. Uh, because you want the sample to be a representative of the whole. So 100 people in your sample, 10 people that you talk to or get answers from should be Hispanic. Uh, same thing if 50% if, if of the people in New York State are white, then 50% of your uh, targeted sample should be white. If 10% if of the population in New York is are white women over the age of 60, then your sample should also be 10% white women over the age of 60. So you want to keep the proportions of people in your sample equal to the proportions of people, certain groups of people in the whole. Uh, and that way, the sample is a good statistical representation of the whole. Okay. No matter how well you construct your sample, though, it's still just a small sample of the whole. And just because uh, the ten, uh, just because you you speak to ten percent of Hispanic people in your sample to get a a, 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 a answers from, doesn't mean that those ten percent of Hispanics that you talk to or of your sample. Uh, represent uh, fairly and equally the 10% of Hispanics in the, in, the, in the whole state. So you're going to get errors simply because you're not questioning all the people, just a sample. That error is what we call a margin of error. And if you've ever seen a poll uh, presented, the results of a poll presented on TV or in a newspaper, you'll always see at the bottom of the poll an asterisk that says sampling error, meaning the margin of error that's the result of the fact that you only talk to a sample of people, not the entire group of people that uh, you're trying to discern the opinion of. You're not talking to all one million people in New York, you're only talking to 10% of the people, 100 people, uh, 1%, whatever, uh, uh, 100 people. And so uh, there's a sampling error here, plus or minus five points. So here's an example where uh, you have two candidates running for office, and as a result of the poll, you... Uh, 52% of the people who responded to you said that they're going to vote for candidate A, and the other 48% said they're going to vote for candidate B. So according to this poll, candidate A is leading candidate B by four percentage points. However, there's a sampling error, a margin of error, of plus or minus five points, which means that these numbers could be skewed by as much as five points either way, either uh, above or below. So that means that candidate A's uh, real uh, percentage of, of support could be anywhere between 47% and 57%, a range of 10, uh, because it could be either, f either anywhere between uh, five points less than 52, uh, anywhere between zero to five points less or zero to five points above. It could be exactly 52 or it could be anywhere between 45, uh, 47, sorry, and 57. Same thing for NAB. It could be anywhere between 
43 minus 5 to 53 above. So the fact that the difference between the two candidates, four percentage points, is less than the margin of error means that this uh, poll result is within the margin of error. And what, what it means to be within the margin of error is that the difference between the two numbers is less than the sampling error, which means that the only thing we can really say here is that it's a very close race. Either candidate could win. Either candidate could actually be in the lead. We just don't know. Right. Okay, here's another example of uh, of uh, of uh, let's say it's the same two candidates, candidate A and B. This time the poll says that candidate A is leading candidate B, fifty-four to forty-six percent by a margin of eight. So let's say this uh, same race, uh, this poll was taken first, this poll was taken two months later, and as a result of the two months, candidate A you know, is doing better, candidate B is, is, is not doing as well. And now we've got an eight point difference. Uh, do we still have a, have a sampling error of plus or minus five points, which means that candidate A could be anywhere between 50, uh, 49, sorry, and 59, and candidate B can be anywhere between 41 and 51. However, uh, candidate A is leading candidate B by a percentage point, which means that it's outside the margin of error because the difference between the two numbers here, 8, is higher than the sampling error of plus or minus 5. And so that means that we can definitely say that candidate A is leading in the poll, uh, not by much, but we know that candidate A is leading, whereas here we don't know. Uh, because if it's going to be uh, plus or minus five off for one, it's going to be the same number off for the other. So if it's a minus five off for candidate A, it's also a minus five off for candidate B. It can't be minus five off for candidate A and plus five off for candidate B. It's got to be one or the other. So because uh, the two numbers always have to add up to a hundred, so the fact that candidate is leading by eight here means that we know candidate is leading. Could be uh, as much as uh, uh, three, uh, which is eight minus five, or it could be as much as 13, uh, but, you know, that's, that uh, uh, could, could be, you know, anywhere between that, that range. Because if it's 59, uh, for for candidate uh, A, then it's only 41 for candidate B, right? Uh, same thing here. If it's off by two, let's say, the real number is off by two, we don't really know what the real number is because we don't know, we, we never know what the sampling error really is, but we know it could be anywhere between plus or minus as many as five, zero to five. If it's uh, off by two, then candidate A would be 50, and then candidate B would be 50, and it would be dead even. Okay, so it could be, uh, you know, we don't know here who's really winning, whereas here, because the numbers are uh, outside the margin of error, uh, plus or minus five, we know that candidate A is actually uh, winning, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, pretty much uh, everything you need to know about public opinion. Uh, I'll see you next time.